Is that? All right. All right. I forgot to turn my microphone on. Yeah. All right. So we go to Google and we type something in. In this case, I typed in CSS3. And I hit the button, and up comes a list of pages about CSS3. So let's imagine, in, let's imagine what's happening, all right? And let's see if this makes sense, all right? There's a room full of engineers at Google. They're just waiting for you to type something in. And the second that you type it in, they go in and they open up Notepad, and they start typing and they create a web page with search results based on what you've typed in, right? This is an HTML page, right? We can see, we can go and look and view source. Now, it's very compressed. What, let, let's back up for a second. Why do you think it's very compressed like this? You can't read this. How come they didn't follow the, well, we'll, we'll come back to that part. We'll come back to that part. First things first. All right. So, but trust me, it is an HTML page. Look, there's a link. There's a li, a list item, and so on. So it's an HTML page. And I go and search for something else. Um, HTML5. Same thing. There's a, a web page that's created. So is there a room full of engineers waiting for you to type something in and then creating a web page for you? Now, eBay must also have their own room full of engineers because as I go in and look at an item, let's go and let's look at laptops. If I were to log on, let's say, and place a bid on a laptop, say this one, if I were to go in and place a bid on this laptop, right now it shows the starting bid is 295. If I went in and put in a bid of 296, all right, it would instantly show 296. So again, there must be a team of engineers at eBay waiting for me to bid on that. And when they do, they hurry up and they open up at Notepad, the HTML page for this. And they go in and they change it. And then the next person will see the bid's 296. Obviously, that isn't the case. All right. Obviously, there's not room full of these HTML developers that are sitting around making these changes to these pages because it would be it's, it's ludicrous to think of that. You know, um, if you th yeah, as I say, if you think of Amazon, how many projects does Amazon have, or products does Amazon sell? Is there going to be a web page for every one of them, a, a separate web page for every one of them? Think of all the possible things you can search for Google. Is there a web page made? pre-made for every one of them? And the answer to all these is, of course not. So something else must be going on, all right, for this stuff to work, for this kind of stuff to work, all right? What do you suppose is going on? Yes? Yeah, server-side scripts. Now, what is a server-side script? Well, a server-side script is a program whose job it is to make web pages. Okay, and these server-side scripts can take a variety of different things, can take the input that the user types in the form. If you remember when we went back to Google, we type something in here. We enter in what we were looking for on that form, all right, in that text box, in the page reflects that. So server-side scripts can take what's entered on the page. It can look at a database. Again, uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, Google has a database of all the web pages that they found out on the web, and it can look at that. And it can construct, and it can write a web page for you. Therefore, there's no need for there to be a separate web page for every Google results. There's one web page that's written that actually is a program. It has logic in it. It has some intelligence in it. And that program's job is to write web pages. 
Now you might say to yourself, well, gee, did I learn HTML for nothing, right? And the answer to that, of course, is no, all right? Why did you not learn HTML for nothing? Well, because you have to write the programs that are the server-side scripts that are going to write the web pages. So if you're going to write a program to create HTML, you better know how to create HTML yourself. I mean, that's like a rule of any sort of programming, right? You can't write a computer program to do something that you yourself don't know how to do, right? So, therefore, you're going to be authoring the scripts to, to, to create these pages as opposed to the pages themselves. So, therefore, you, know, you need to know the HTML. Okay, so what's the difference between this kind of page, a page that's created by server-side scripting, and a HTML page that we've talked about so far? Well, probably the, 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 the more precise terms for these are static versus dynamic pages. Uh, the word static means it doesn't change. So, for example, if you were to look at assignment one that you turned in, you know, the first week of class, if you were to open that up again, it's going to look exactly like the day when you turned it in, right? It's a static document. That is the document is defined, and that's how it looks unless someone goes in and manually changes it, all right? Now, in the case of Google or eBay or a weather page or a page for a TV network, or a page that shows, uh, you know, results of sporting contests, all right? Someone isn't going in and changing those pages. Something else changes. Maybe the database changes or the user input asks for something else or whatever. And those pages get created on the fly. So with server-side scripts, you're not writing a web page. You're writing instructions of how a web page is created using HT, uh, you know, outputting HTML using what's entered in the form and stuff from the database and so on. All right. The difference that I like to say is like the difference between ordering a sandwich from Subway and one from McDonald's. Right. If you go into McDonald's and order a sandwich, um, for the most part, um, they simply just go and reach in the bin and give you one. So if you order a Big Mac, they just turn around, look for the Big Mac bin, pull one out, and hand it to you. All right. Next person comes in, asks for a Big Mac, same thing. Those sandwiches are pre-made, and they're just sitting waiting to be delivered. All right. In the case of a server-side script, it's more like it is at Subway. All right. If you think about it, if you go into Subway and you order something, all right, a turkey club, for example, they'll ask you, what kind of bread do you want it on? You know, do you want it toasted? What kind of cheese? What kind of vegetables? Do you want any kind of dressing? And so on and so forth. All right. In other words, they don't have a bin sitting on the ba in the back with all the different possibilities. A turkey club on wheat, a turkey club on white, um, and so on down the line. Turkey club with uh, lettuce and peppers, a turkey club with uh, mayonnaise and tomatoes. You know, they don't have all those possibilities there because that would be impractical, just like it would be impractical for Google to have all those web pages sitting out there. What they have instead is they have a server, a person working there, that has some instructions in their head of how to make a turkey club, all right? And then asks the user, that is the customer, for certain parameters like what kind of bread, do you want it toasted, what kind of vegetables, any kind of toppings, and so on down the list. So in that way, they don't have to have a bin full of all these sandwiches, which wouldn't be very practical, right? Um, they create one on the fly based on whatever precise instructions the user gives them. So if we're going to draw a diagram, it would look like this. In the case of regular static web pages, we have our client, who's the person browsing the web, accessing the internet, And the web server simply grabs the completed HTML files and delivers them to the client. And when I say HTML, I mean a combination of HTML and Java, uh, JavaScript and CSS, all the kinds of things that, that browsers understand. 
So that gets delivered to the, uh, to the client. In the case of a dynamic page, the client might enter some form data. For example, with Google, what is it that you're searching for? That information goes to the server. The server takes that plus maybe a database, plus maybe other stuff, and has instead of a completed web page, has a script. Or a recipe, if you will, for how to take that user input, the stuff in the database, and transform it into an HTML document. Now notice in both cases that the client gets delivered an HTML document, right? You go to Subway or McDonald's, you come out with a sandwich, right? Um, you don't come out of Subway with a recipe, right? You can't eat a recipe. You can only eat a sandwich. And it's the same way with static and dynamic web pages. In both cases, the web server delivers some HTML to the client. It's just a question of, how that HTML was created. Was it created in advance and just out there sitting waiting? Or was it created on the fly by the web server, taking these scripts along with databases, form data, and possibly some other things, and putting it all together to create an HTML page? Now, these scripts are written in languages such as PSP, ASP.NET, and so on. And their job is to output HTML. Their job is to take all this stuff and output HTML. Now, we don't cover server-side scripting in this class. All right, We cover the creation of HTML, which is a good starting point. Right? And you do need to know that. But the one piece of this puzzle that we are going to talk about is how to create a form so that we can pass data to a web server. All right. Now we've all seen forms on web pages. You know, they're, they're, you know, this is an example of a form on a web page where we have a text box that you can type data into and do a search. If we go into Angel and log on, This is a form. It's asking for a username and password. If we were to go, for example, to Amazon and sign up for a new account, all right, that's a form. If we go to Google Mail and sign up for a new account, yeah, that's more what I was looking for. We have a form where we can enter in our first name, last name, our username, a password, birthday, gender, and so on down the line. I agree to the policy and procedures and so on. All this is information that gets sent to the web server so the web server can do its job. All right? In creating web pages on the fly and in updating databases and doing other sorts of things that HTML itself can't do. So, we're not going to we're not going to worry about in this class how that data gets processed. We're simply going to work on the data gathering part and how to create a form. All right? So what I want to do now is I want to start by pulling up and, and actually creating the HTML for a simple form. Now, if you've heard me talk about this, forms usually go in conjunction with some server-side script. So we have a form that we enter information in. We send that to a server-side script to be processed. And 
whatever the script does with the data, well, it depends on a particular application. In the case of Google, um, it'll do a search. In the case of signing up for Gmail, it will actually create an account for us in their database. In the case of Angel, it will log you on. All right? But to really understand forms, we need to see how you create the form, and then we need to know how it connects to a server-side script. Now the dilemma is, is we're not going to write any server-side scripts in this class. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to write our forms to hook to someone else's server-side script. All right? And this isn't like something shady or anything. It's like they allow you to do that, you know. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to write a form that we create that's going to call the search script on Bing, which is Microsoft's um, search engine. So let's go and do a quick search here on Bing. So I'm going to go in here, and again, that's a form. I'm going to go in here and type in CSS3. And I see these results. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and I'm going to create a form to do that. Oops. I typed in CSS3 and I get these search results. So I'm going to create a form to do that. All right, so I'm going to go and open Notepad. in all the basic tags that are on every page virtually. Now, again, I'm going to keep this pretty bare bones because I want you to see the code without any clutter. Later on we'll go in and style it. First thing we need to do is we need to put a form tag on here. Now if you're copying this down, leave some space. Because we're going to put some stuff, we're going to put some attributes on the form tag. But for now I'm just going to put a form tag. And then of course I put the corresponding end form tag. Because it's good practice for every tag to have an end tag. Now, think of this form tag as being like an envelope that we're going to put all the data that we're going to send to the server. Now, we may only be sending one thing to the server. All right. For example, when we do a Bing search, we might only send the thing that we're searching for to the server. Or we may send other things to the server. For example, when I went in to sign up for a Gmail account. There are a lot of different things. My first name, my last name, my gender, um, my birthday, and so on. So I might send one thing or I might send a bunch of things. But think of it as sort of a package that you're sending to the server. So everything that's related to that package that you want to send to the server at the same time goes in the form tag. So that form tag is going to wrap around a set of other tags. And those other tags are going to be the um, stuff that we're going to send to the, the server. All right. So, I'm just going to put some text there, search for, and then I'm going to put an input tag. An input tag is a tag that allows us to create text boxes, and other kinds of form inputs. This will allow the user to enter stuff in. Now, there'll be different tags for the different kinds of inputs. 
You know, we've seen drop downs as inputs, we've seen check boxes, there are radio buttons, and so on. For our first example, because I really want to focus on the mechanism by which the form and the server talk to each other, we're going to keep it very simple, and I'm simply going to use a text box. And in fact, I'm only going to use one single text box. So, input type equals whoops, text name equals Q. We'll talk about why I came up with that name in a few minutes here. It's not, I didn't just make that up. All right. And it's not a tribute to the character on Star Trek, if you were wondering that as well. All right. All right. Then I'm going to put a submit button. This is a tribute to a character on Star Trek. All right. So what I have, and we'll go and we'll look at this. I'll save this as an HTML document on the desktop. And then we'll run it and we'll look at, look at it. I open this up in a browser, what do I see? I see the word search for, I see a text box, and then I see a button. Now if I click this button, nothing happens. Why? Because I haven't wired this form to the web server. I haven't connected the form to the web server. So Bing server is out there, all right, but this ain't wired to it. What we're going to do next is we're going to wire this to the Bing server. So, if we can look at these two things side by side, sort of. There's the text that says search for. Right? There it is. Here is the text box. And finally, here is the submit button. And whatever its value is, gets put on the button. Now we're going to wire this to Bing's web server, all right, so that there's someone that's going to be processing this form data. It's going to do something with it, all right. And I'm going to put in here two attributes. First one is method equals get. And we'll talk about what that does in a minute here. The second one is action equals HTTP colon slash slash www.bing.com slash search. Now, how did I know to put this in there? Well, I did a little bit of reverse engineering, and we'll look at that in a second, how I figured that out. But for now, just trust me that this is what I need to do to hook my form up to the Bing search engine. The two things I need to do are, number one, I need to set the method and, get, uh, and action attribute to point to this script, and this is a script on the Bing server. The second thing I need to do is I need to make sure that text box is named Q. And we'll come back and we'll, we'll look at that in a second and how I knew that. All right. So now I'm going to go and save it. And I'm going to go and open it up. And I have an extra something in there.
What do you mean I didn't close that? No. You don't need a backslash because this is the end tag for form. Ah, it's way over here. Oh, that's right, because I, I put it in. I put, okay, gotcha. All right. So now I go and I search for CSS3, and I click the button, and it calls the Bing search engine and does the search for CSS3. So my page is wired to the Bing server-side script. And if I go in and search for anything else, um, Lorraine County, and click search, it shows search results associated with Lorraine County. Okay, let's figure out how I knew how to wire this. I knew how to wire this by doing a little bit of reverse engineering. That is, I went into the Bing program, or Bing web page, and did a search. And I looked very closely at this, the URL that got called. Because this is the name of the script that did the processing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up in Notepad so I can make it bigger. All right. HTTP bing.com slash search. Look familiar? That is what I used for the action. That's the name of the script that is to be called. Now, why did I stop at the question mark? Well, at the question mark begins what is called the query string. All right. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can send data to a server-side script. But one of the ways is via the query string. And therefore, everything after the question mark is really the data that we want to send to the web server. All right? And notice something. Notice what's after the question mark. There's actually pairs of fields. I'm going to go and separate these out a little bit. It's actually pairs of fields. There's a name of a field, there's an equal sign, and there's a value. So Q equals CSS3. Look familiar? That's what I put in to do the search for. QS equals N. What does that mean? No clue. No, the N doesn't stand for no clue. The, <laughs> I really just don't have a clue of what the N stands for. And so on down the line. Now, through a little bit of experimenting, I found that the only thing that this script really needs is it needs a value called Q. And in that value called Q, it needs the name of the thing that we're searching for. So therefore, that is why when I created this, that text box I called Q. All right? That Q then is going to be the name of this data on the query string. So the query string is going to contain data from the form that it's sending to that script. So if I go up here and I type in that I want to search for Thanksgiving, all right and I hit the search button, that search button is going to call the script bing.com slash search. And it's going to put on the query string all the data from this form. Now I only have the one field, or actually two fields if you count the button. But when I click it, notice then what I get is bing.com search and then after the search is the data that's on the form and the important one really is the one 
of the Q. Q equals Thanksgiving because that's the term. That's where it's going to look for the term that you want to search for. So, how do you know these things? Well, if you're working on a real project, you or someone from your team is writing both the form and the script that does the processing. So, you know what you need to call things. If you call, you know, if you have a field for phone number, you know that the name of the field is phone no or phone number or whatever. All right? In the case of this, where I'm using someone else's script, either a little bit of reverse engineering or sometimes they provide documentation that will tell you how to use that and what to call your fields. So to review, I have a form. This is everything that I'm going to send to the server. This is the name of the server-side script that I'm going to be calling. All right up to the query string, so I don't include the question mark or anything after it. I then name the different things on the form with the proper name, and these input fields will be put on the query string and passed to the server-side script. Now, we have to make sure that all these things work together and are in sync. In other words, I have to make sure that I have the right name for the script and I have to call my text box what that script is expecting. Because if I call this something else, it's not going to work. doesn't work. Why? Well, because the script doesn't find the data that it's looking for under the name of Q. Because I've given it the name of Q, 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 something goofy. All right. So that's how the script and my form work together. All right. This points to the script that I want to call. And again, either you'll write it so you'll know what it's called or someone will give that to you. And likewise, you have to give these things the appropriate name. Now, what does this get mean? This get means that we are going to pass the data to the script via the query string. There's actually a couple ways that you can pass data from your form to the, to, to the server-side script. And the query string is just one of the ways. It's the way that makes most sense when I'm trying to teach this because we can actually see then up on the URL the values from the query string. If we did it the other way, we wouldn't be able to see them and, and it would be harder to understand. All right. For this class, we can pretty much just do everything with a get. All right. And that'll be fine. Questions on any of this? Let's try to make this more advanced. Let's go. Does Bing have an advanced search? I sure hope so. Let's do this. Let's say I want to choose a language. All right, let's change our and let's let's go and let's let's go and let's do some searches here. Let's say I want to see French web pages. All right, so I'll go and save that setting, and then I'll go to Bing. And I'll search for PHP. All right. And absolutely nothing happened. Must have done something wrong.
Okay. Cool. All right. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it does it on the query string, so it might use another mechanism to do that. All right. Let's try... Try map quest. Put an address in. Again, they're not showing the data on the query string. They're passing it another way, so this doesn't make for a good example. Yeah, let's try Google Maps. And it also doesn't, unfortunately, show up on the query string, so it's, it would be harder to demonstrate. Try YouTube search. Let's search for database design. Oh, looky here, one of my videos. I didn't do that on purpose, honest. 13,000 views. Wow. Whenever I'm feeling low, I always go and look at the views on. There, there's a couple of them on database design that are very popular, and it's like that always is a nice little ego stroke. At any rate, let's look at this, all right? Let's, make, let's change this page to a YouTube search. So let's look at the URL. All right. Let's go and look at the URL. And the URL for this search is youtube.com search query equals. All right. So I'll go and I'll change this. To YouTube results. And it is looking for the 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 search term in the in the thing called search query. So let's go and do that. So that's the name that it's looking for. So I'll go and save this. Here we are. We get the same results back. Now let's play around with some of these other searches. Let's go and or Looking for an advanced search option on here.
let's see. Uh, building images short search. Here we go. No, no. Hmm. I'm looking for an example where there'd be more parameters on this than just the one search field. They're encoding the data, but shoot. Right, let's see. I'm trying to think of any of the other popular search or We'll try one more and then we'll give up. Okay. Advanced search. That's what I want. Ah, here we go. All of these words, HTML, and let's say I only want to see that from France. Let's go and do a little bit of dissecting on this URL. BC appears to be the country. And P equals what we're searching for. So let's try that. Now if I go and save this, search for HTML, country France, all right, notice that it's searching for pages from France, all right, let's go and type in a different country. from the United States. 
United States. Okay, good. Finally, I apologize for that. It's just it, it gets confusing because I'll, if I do these examples one semester, in the meantime they change the way, exactly the manner in which they do things, and and I can't reuse some of my examples, so I sometimes get a little confused. All right, so here's what I'm given two fields for, and if I look, I'm giving them both on the query string. P equals HTML, VC equals US. Now, what's wrong with what I'm doing here where I have a text box to put the country name in? Yeah, who knows what the, co what the country code is? You know, some of the few ones I can, I can manage, but, you know, what if it was Estonia? What is the country abbreviated for, for Estonia? I have no idea, all right, and so on. So, what would be better than having a plain text box for this? Yes, having a drop down or radio buttons or check boxes and so on. So in this case, what I want to search for, I could search for anything, right? So that makes sense for that to be a free form text field where I can type anything I want to in. But country, there's only a certain number of selections, you know. There's a lot of them, but there's only a certain number of selections that are valid. All right, I can't just make up codes. And it won't work very well if I do. So what we want to do is we want to then use some of the other form elements, like drop downs or radio buttons or check boxes. That's where we will pick up on Wednesday, taking and adding additional fields and additional kinds of fields to the search to make for uh, uh, you know a, a better, more advanced sort of search. All right, we'll see you in lab.